Welcome to our session today, which we'll be looking at alternative risk transfer for the DB pensions market. I'm Rod Goodyear, Head of Investment Consulting at Barnett Waddingham. The aim of the session today is going to be to review developments within this market over the last year, discuss why the floodgates haven't yet opened in terms of numbers of transactions seen, considering what might change this position, and also looking at the leg legislative position more widely around the funding code and the current DWP consultation. Before we start with the technical content, though, I just want to give you a quick overview of the platform. If you'd like to ask a question during the session, you can send this to us via the Q&A box next to the media window, and we'll follow up any of those questions that we get individually after the event. On the icon menu at the bottom of your screen are also a number of tools you may find useful. If you'd like to get in touch with me or any of the other speakers today, you can just click on the speaker access button and re receive our contact details. Our LinkedIn profiles are provided here, and we'd love to connect with you. The Resource Center contains other literature that we're also sharing relevant to the topic. If you experience any technical difficulties, please refer to the console help guide, which will offer some troubleshooting solutions. If you would like to discuss the topic in more detail, please do book a meeting with us using the button. And finally, please take the time to give feedback at the end of the session via the feedback form. We really value receiving your feedback as it really helps us to construct our conference program going forwards to best meet your needs. So moving on to the topic for today, I'll start by defining what we actually mean by alternative risk transfer in this context. So what we are talking about today is non-insurance based solutions, which allow the transfer of most or all of the risks of a DB scheme away from the sponsor. So examples of this would be capital back consolidators or capital back journey plans. The most high, high profile deal to date of one of these transactions was between the Sears Retail Pension Scheme and Clara Pensions last year. This deal achieved a clean break with the sponsor as the scheme transferred fully into a commercial consolidator. Under the Clara model, the Clara Trustee Board will then continue to operate their scheme with the objective of ultimately securing a full buyout of the liabilities for all of their legacy Sears members. Approaching one year on from the Clara deal, we caught up with Simon True at Clara last week for his views on how things have developed since then. The UK's first super fund transaction was between uh, the Sears uh, Retail Pension Scheme and Clara. Uh, this was a £600 million scheme with 10,000 members. Um, and we worked with the uh, Sears trustees over an extended period to facilitate this transaction. We worked with the, the trustees over an extended period of time. Uh, their, their sponsor was insolvent, uh, and their options were to go to the PPF or to run a managed process through to, to buyout. Uh, we were able to engage with the trustees to, to effectively create a third option for them where they could move to the Clara scheme uh, as a bridge to buyout, um, and that Clara would bring new capital to support their member benefits. So having engaged with the trustees for a period of the Clara model and why that was in their members' interests, um, they didn't actually have enough assets to meet the Clara price, but what we did was we set up a review mechanism whereby we would price the, the scheme on a regular basis. And in 2023, uh, we managed to reach the situation where the scheme assets were sufficient to meet the Clara price. And so once that trigger had, had been reached, uh, the whole everything moved into gear very, very quickly, and the trustees and their advisors moved to secure that increase in member benefits through the additional funding. And so we agreed uh, key commercial terms around the middle of, of August of that year, uh, at which point the scheme assets were hedged very uh, closely to Clara's position. And we moved in a period of six weeks to signing the bulk transfer agreement uh, by the end of September. So it's actually a very, very focused piece of work. And what was the key feature of that was the joint solve nature of it, that the trustees, their advisors, Clara and Clara's advisors were all working to improve those member outcomes in a way that meant that the transaction moved very, very slowly, even though it was a precedent transaction, the first super fund transaction of its, of its kind. And of course, TPR played a key role in that as well, in terms of making sure that the clearance process was expedited and that we locked into those uh, benign market conditions in 2023. Uh, moving now to the to the member experience, uh, one of the features of this first transaction was that we didn't change the administrators. So the incumbent administrators met our criteria for a business partner. They'd obviously looked after the, the CS uh, members very well. 
um, and we were very keen not to disturb that. Um, and having engaged with them to ensure that they could meet our standards for engagement with, with members, uh, we were very happy to work with them uh, and you know, in some cases improve uh, the, the level of communication. And we've obviously worked very, very closely with them to make the service level standards continue to be met um, and that we can do everything that we can to improve the member experience. So that's been a, a really good success story for us. You know, 10,000 members that came in uh, we feel have been have been dealt with very very well, uh, and we've certainly had you know, positive uh, feedback from them. What did we learn from the process? Um, well, of course, we were bound to learn something, it being the the first first transaction. But I think what we learned was actually a validation of uh, of a number of things. And the first is that you know the the model works, um, that that having members front and center of any transaction actually transforms it and makes it much more streamlined for everybody that, that we actually don't spend our time on immaterial issues, that we don't waste time perhaps engaging on, on, on immaterial issues. Um, that, that certainly was a, was a key validation. But of course there were learnings about the ways that we can make, make things easier, about the way we can make it easier for trustees to understand the Clara model the way that we can make it easier for trustees to rely on previous due diligence, to engagement with, with the regulator, uh, streamlining the, the, the clearance process. But there was an awful lot that went very, very well in that transaction. It was full credit to the CS trustees and their advisors that they engaged in it in such an open uh, and constructive way and, and certainly facilitated a great outcome for their members. In terms of next steps uh, for Clara, well, we believe very passionately in putting members first. We also believe very strongly that there are considerable benefits to consolidation that can be shared with members. And these come from lower administration costs, improved governance, lower governance costs, access to superior investment advice, lower investment costs, um, engagement with the regulator, more frequent reporting, enhanced security of members' benefits, these are all benefits uh, of the model that we're keen to share with as many members as we possibly can. So having done the first Sears transaction, we followed that up with the Demolence transaction. And so we're now at the time of this recording, uh, we're at 1.2 uh, billion pounds of assets and management and 20,000 members. But we're hoping uh, very shortly to announce our third and fourth transactions. And these will have different features. Um, so both of these will involve active sponsors. So this is a sponsor choosing to actually uh, engage with Clara, inject some money into the scheme to facilitate the transfer to Clara. There'll be new capital coming in as well. So substantially improving the security of members' benefits and making that transfer to uh, buyout uh, destination more certain. Um, our ambitions, are, uh, uh, I wouldn't say unlimited, but they're virtually, they are very much in the tens of billions of pounds of assets and the management and hundreds of thousands of members. We want to extend the benefits of consolidation to as many members as we possibly can. And we have the backing of our investors to support those very ambitious uh, plans. Thank you. Thank you to Simon for his thoughts there. I'm very pleased to be joined for our discussions today by an expert panel. Lynn Rawcliffe is an experienced professional trustee at Lord Adventure. Lynn works with a range of clients as a trustee at Lord Adventure, but also has experience acting as a trustee for Clara Pensions, so she is able to comment from both sides of these kinds of transactions. I'm also joined on the panel by Richard Gibson, a partner at BW who specialises in risk transfer and has been particularly involved in areas of innovation within the market and some of the most cutting edge solutions seen. Lynn, we'll start with your sort of thoughts as a trustee. What have you learned from the first couple of deals that have been done? Thanks, Rod. Um, I guess um, starting maybe with my general trustee hat on and seeing how this, the first two deals have helped the, with the Sears pension scheme and the Debenhams scheme. I guess that the main thing that um, you can see is how good it's been for members, actually. Um, it's easy to think, oh, put members first is just a bit of a slogan of marketing. It's really not. I think it was pleasing to see how um, that that was 
as the case uh, throughout the two transactions. Um, in particular, I'd call out with the Debenhams pension scheme, how because that was a PPF plus case, members had not been receiving their full pension entitlement if they were already a pensioner member of that scheme um, because it was unsure whether they'd be able to afford to give members all their benefits. Um, but after moving to Clara with that better certainty of being able to pay for all members' benefits now and, and in, into the future, those pensioner members received a back payment um, of, of the arrears of the pension payments that they, uh, they'd they not been receiving. So brilliant from day one that that happened. Um, there was also no change in the administrator uh, for the two transactions, which I think meant that members actually didn't see many other changes. They didn't have to get used to dealing with a different um, person, you know, in terms of any queries they had about their pensions or how they could access uh, information about the benefits that they had. Um, but, but obviously they do have another um, contact in Clara. Um, if I look separately at then how it was being one of the trustees working a, on the Clara trustee board, I think what was really positive to see was just the sheer volume of due diligence being carried out on the two schemes making sure that everything was known. But, you know, it, it's not that the two schemes had to be um, in a perfect data position or had completed everything like you might with buyout, but they, um, they obviously we had to go into it knowing exactly what scheme was coming into the Clara super fund. Um, the, there was robust challenge um, and advice and the regulator in particular was, um, you know, spent a lot of time working with the Clara um, team that supports the trustees as well as the Clara team that kind of is the corporate backing and the Clara trustees. And I think that everyone collaborating together means that we've kind of, it's, it's brilliant that these deals have been done and members truly are uh, in, a, in a more secure place. Thanks, Lynn. That's, that's a really helpful insight to start us off. Um, Richard, turning to you more from the sort of consultancy side, what have you seen in terms of the growth and interest in the alternative risk transfer space over the last year, both in terms of interest from pension schemes and I guess the, the number of providers in the market? Yeah, hi, Rod. Hi, Lynn. Uh, sounds like we had a really interesting year. Um, so <clears> over <throat> the same period, I guess we've seen a huge interest in the alternative risk transfer space. Um, so I guess this is in the context where uh, across the pension scheme market, you know, we think around one third of schemes have the financial positions to afford to buy out. Um, given that high number of pension schemes approaching the insurers or preparing to approach the insurers, um, there's a lot of interest from capital providers in looking into how they can support the next group down of schemes, uh, those who aren't yet in that position to go to buy out. Um, and this is a really active space. So as beyond working with Clara, of course, uh, we've been working with nine other alternative providers. They've all got different solutions, uh, but the common thread amongst them is that there's an external party offering to put up their capital, to back a pension scheme, uh, to take risk, and hoping to take profits from the risk that's being run. Uh, we've got multiple live cases uh, considering these types of structures um, and, and we've had cases during the year where contracts have been negotiated um, and, and put in front of the regulator. So some very advanced processes have, have been in flow. Thanks, Richard. Sort of following on from that, Clara obviously followed on from the CS deal with the, the, the second deal in Q1 this year with, with Debenhams, which was, again was a, a cutting edge deal given it was a PPF plus deal. Um, after these first two deals had, had been done, there was a lot of talk in the market about sort of the floodgates potentially opening and seeing a wave of transactions. That has not yet come to pass, albeit Simon's just hinted. Um, that obviously he's got some some more deals pretty close. What do you think, Richard, is holding holding us up and present from seeing that wave of transactions come through? 
Yeah, so 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 no one's been idle here, Rod. I mean, I think you know we we have a lot of our own clients uh, in progress with Clara, um, and some deals in progress at the moment. And um, as I say, Simon has uh, given the good news earlier um, around the the transactions that have signed. Um, but it's not surprising to me that that Clara have had a quieter period after writing those two you know, sizable deals. Uh, they needed to bed down their uh, their, uh, their their operational proposition um, and. And during the year, Simon's alluded to how they've sought additional capital to expand their appetite for, for new business. Uh, so I think it puts them in a very good place looking forwards. Even so, if Clara are looking to grow to 10 or 12 billion uh, in size, that's still a very modest appetite compared to the value of pension schemes out there who could benefit from this type of solution. So I think, you know, a rosier, uh, I expect a busier period coming up. Thanks, Richard. And Lynn, turning to you and thinking about the trustee perspective, how are these kind of alternative risk transfer solutions being considered amongst trustee boards, do you think? And, you know, to, to what extent are they a priority for discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think is um, a, something that's on many schemes radar, you know, thinking about their end game, I, I guess. The schemes that can afford to do a buyout now um, it are probably, and there are more of them given what happened in 2020, 2022 with the guilt crisis. I, I think because Clara is essentially a stepping stone to buy out, those are no longer kind of part of the pipeline because um, you just go straight to an insurer um, or maybe do it within the next two or three years if there is you know, small things that you need to, to resolve before you can do. I think the DWP consultation that came out earlier this year as well around um, use of surplus um, means that some schemes want to wait and see what happens there, particularly maybe schemes that are, are a little bit bigger because sponsors might have more appetite to think about running on the pension scheme. Um, yeah, I do see Clara being able to help a large number of pension schemes. Um, I do sometimes wonder to what extent those schemes are all familiar with how Clara works um, and, and, you know, would therefore just maybe encourage other trustees um, to make sure that if they're thinking about endgame, they do think about um, alternatives such as Clara or a capital back journey plan in case that could be uh, appropriate but bearing in mind, you know, every scheme has its own unique set of circumstances, different sponsor views, different rules, etc. So um, I think it's in the mix, um, but I can also see why maybe um, it's not been as quick to see more transactions this year. Um, I do think there's a good pipeline out there. So. Yep. Thanks, Lynn. Sort of, Richard. Following on from that, what what have you seen? Sort of looking now, sort of beyond Clara. What are the the common hurdles that are sort of holding up these transactions from proceeding at the at present? Yeah, so I, th I think three things. So uh, the DWP consultation Lynn's just mentioned, um, changing funding positions of schemes, um, and and the challenges around regulatory approval. Uh, and you, you mentioned beyond Clara, but I mean the, these challenges also um, stalked the Clara proposition in, in its earlier years before uh, managed to get uh, some deals away. So, I, and I guess to add a little bit of colour to those ideas on the DWP consultation, um, it's, it's great that DWP are exploring new possibilities. Uh, it does mean, you know, with re you know regulatory uncertainty, the providers uh, have a tendency to pause processes whilst they wait to see how how the uh, how the government consultation plays out uh, in terms of the regulator involvement i mean simon true actually made several references to the regulator in his comments earlier about the first deal uh, and that's because the regulator is critical to a successful transaction uh, in this space the structures we're talking about um, beyond clara are are not zero risk products uh, and we have to appreciate it can be difficult um, to regulate novel solutions. But having said that, over the past year, I have seen a, you know, a refreshing willingness from TPR to engage on these types of solutions and greater openness from them to, to examine uh, new and novel structures. 
Thanks. And, and what sort of innovation do you think is potentially coming in this space then in terms of novel structures as you've just described it? Yeah, so I think on the consolidated side, uh, there are two innovations already that we've been working on over the past year that are uh, not yet out there in, in public. So one is the is the connected covenant solution, which Simon uh, again mentioned on, on the call earlier, talking about how um, act schemes with uh, sort of still strong sponsoring employers are able to take advantage of the Clara solution, transferring their pension scheme into Clara but still retaining on their balance sheet an ultimate guarantee uh, for the scheme members uh, if Clara should, should fail to deliver. Uh, this is a great innovation, opens the space up to solvent employers, um, and it's much more effective in terms of risk transfer than a DB Master Trust would be. Uh, the second thing that, that's already out there um, is the recent TPR guidance on how capital backers um, can draw profits um, particularly uh, in near insolvency scenarios. Uh, and I think that will be very helpful in terms of making providers willing to come forward and operate in this market, and expanding the types of deals that can be done. Um, and finally, I think you know, the, the big point for future innovation is, of course, the DWP consultation. I think if that creates a more permissive framework for the use of surplus, uh, we'll see some very interesting and innovative structures out there, um, which ultimately will help schemes uh, try to reach their end, uh, end destinations. Thanks, Richard. And in terms of the, the sort of the complexity of all those, those different solutions you've just talked through, what's the best way for a trustee board to try and triage and assess you know, the, the various solutions and providers out there in the market and their suitability for their own circumstances. Uh, so I'm sure, Lynn, you'll, you'll have your thoughts on that. Um, I, mean, I, I think what I would say um, is that innovation is, is, can be challenging in the pension space. Uh, and in my view, I think in order for a new structure to, to find fertile ground, it needs the case with the right circumstances. You need a provider willing to make the running uh, and invest in the case. Uh, you need a trustee who's willing to engage in the, in the detail and, and the novel solution. Advisor experienced in these types of deals. Uh, you need all of that as a special formula, otherwise the deal falls through um, and costs end up being run up. Yeah. And Lynn, from your sort of trustee perspective, how would you see a, a professional trustee helping in these circumstances? Yeah, I, I think um, it, it's maybe no surprise with the first two transactions uh, with Clara, actually, that on the, the two schemes that have gone into Clara, there have been professional trustees. I think, um, you know, we're, we're able to challenge advisors, ask the right questions. Um, maybe we, we work, you know, part time or full time uh, in many cases in pensions, whereas a lot of lay trustees, you know, it's something that they're trying to do on the side of their desk and therefore they just don't have the same amount of time either to, to be able to devote to these new ideas. Um, so I think, I think I, I see it even with, you know, buy-ins, for example, where schemes that have run along for many, many years without a professional trustee do feel that when they're doing a buy-in transaction, knowing that it's the first time for many that they'll do it and and what it means to the scheme that they, they want that extra uh, governance that with, with a professional trustee to be on board. Um, so I do think it makes a difference. I think it can we as we can help fellow trustees have more confidence in proceeding with a transaction because um, of, of kind of extra knowledge and experience that we have and sharing that. Um, and and it, I think what we typically do with the schemes that we work with is, um, you know, we would like to have a step back and have a bit of a strategy meeting when we think about end game. And that would include not just the trustees and but the sponsor, because where there is a sponsor anyway, that's, you know, still connected, um, their views of pretty key and they're a potential beneficiary of the scheme as well. Um, so I think working together um, it is really important to make something happen. Um, it, or even if that's deciding that you're going to run on rather than do something different, um, because you think, well, you know, if you're going to run on when, especially if you could afford to, to take alternative routes, then uh, you need a structure around that. And, 
to do it knowing life rather than just uh, allowing yourself to run on by default. Yeah, I think those those are really good good points, and I've kind of my own experiences. Yeah, all, around all of those end game decisions, whatever they are, a collaborative approach, you know, across trustees and sponsors is, is always likely to bring the, the best solutions and the most efficient working. Um, but Len, you've m- mentioned several times there, kind of similarities, I guess, in, in in terms of the the number of decisions that have to be made and the pace of decision making and the size of those decisions, the similarities between alternative risk transfer and a conventional buy and transaction. From a trustee perspective, how does a transaction such as a Clara one differ from a buyout? That's a good question. Um, I guess on the face of it, either whether you do a buyout or you transfer to Clara, your role as an individual trustee on that scheme does come to an end. Um, But the difference is with Clara that you are handing it to another set of trustees who will continue to look after the members and put members first for a period of time whilst you are trying to, you know, whilst they are trying to get the scheme well enough funded to then do a buyout with an insurer at a later point, which is typically, I think, around five to 10 years in most um, cases, although it is specific to each scheme that transfers to Clara. Um, the, the Clara trustee um, is made up currently of three different professional trustees. One is an individual and the other two are, are professional trustee firms, one one of which is Law Deb. Um, so you're not just accessing either the kind of three professional trustees you're, with, with Law Deb, you access the whole team of trustees and support that can be accessed there if there's something that's relevant. Um, I, I think they've got, um, I guess I'd add as well, just, just while I'm talking about the Clara governance, um, that the regulator, I, you know, they meet regularly with both the Clara trustee and the Clara team. And I, I think the regulation there is another comforting factor for trustees thinking about transferring the scheme to Clara. Um, you also can let the Clara trustees help to progress the scheme in things like GMP equalization. That doesn't need to have been completed. If you need to do some data work, if there's benefit rectification, those things can happen later after the Clara trustees are looking after the scheme. Um, as long as it's kind of these are known things, I think, at the point of the transaction and therefore, you know, that the, the transaction can be organized appropriately to to deal with them later whereas with the buyout obviously you've got to get all those things sorted before you can transfer uh, the the admin ongoing administration of the scheme uh, to an insurance company there's also a difference around uh, discretionary decisions so the clara trustee can still make discretionary decisions around death benefits for example whereas uh, an insurer with a buyout policy may not um, so, so those are some of the headlines, uh, I guess I would flag. Um, so I agree, agree with all of that, Lynn. I would say from my perspective, having sort of advised on both Clara and insurer deals, there's, there's a huge amount of commonality between the two. On the scheme, you know, as trustees, you st- transfer and trustees, you need, still need to do the same things. You need to understand your data. You need to understand your benefits before you can transfer those risks away. You need to set objectives. Uh, and you need to have the right governance for how you run the process um, and then think all those through uh, and understand what risks you're transferring, what risks you're keeping. Yeah. Th- thanks, Richard. And I think just uh, just sort of a final final question sort of to wrap this up to you, to you Richard, in that both, both you have made reference to the, the DWP consultation and the new funding code and what's been said. What, what are you expecting, Richard, from your sort of advisory perspective to, to come out of that potentially in terms of things that might change this market? So I think the two biggest questions, Ron, are whether a permissive regime will be created, uh, introduced to help employers draw surplus out of pension schemes, and secondly, whether and how a public sector consolidator is going to be established. Um, so let's see what the DOP has for us on both those points. Um, but in both cases, I, th- I think they will have effects uh, on the landscape of the solutions that pension schemes can pursue. 
uh, to address their risk. And, and Lynn referred to the, the funding code that, that's coming out, um, that's, that's in force. Um, and I think the funding code makes us think more clearly around what, a, what pension schemes endgame is. I think if you want to take advantage of these types of solutions out there in the wild, um, you can choose to set a consolidator as your long-term target if you can't afford insurance. If you're looking to run on, maybe the answer is in the future you won't have to go it alone. You can use some of this third-party capital that's available to underpin your strategy, maybe protect you from downside um, if that's a concern. So I, I, th I think well, the, the answer is we, we need to wait and see what the DDOP comes out with, um, but there are a lot of opportunities there, um, a lot of interest, as I say, from uh, private capital markets. Thanks. There's, there's probably another webinar there once we do get the consultation. Right. Um, thank you both for your time today and your contributions. That's been really helpful. And uh, thank you to everyone watching as well. Um, I'm going to start wrapping this up now. Uh, please, can you all remember to complete the feedback form as that helps us again sort of design these seminars so we're best meeting your needs. We've had a lot of excellent questions come through and we will come back to you all individually on those. Um, we'll also send out a wrap-up communication to everybody when this series concludes, highlighting the key takeaway points and considerations for you all. And the recording of this session will be sent to you by email tomorrow if you want to review the content again at a later point. Otherwise, I thank you all for joining us today and we'll say goodbye. <laughs>